it. Good boy. <laughs> Adding animated sprite sheets to your games is one of the fastest and the most impactful ways you can bring your games to the next level and add that professional look and polish you want. Games with sprites are great at pulling your audience into the fantasy you are trying to create and they are also really fun to make. Today I will show you everything you need to know about sprite animation with vanilla JavaScript and by the end of this course you will be able to have complete control over any sprite sheet you choose. I will show you easy, beginner-friendly sprite animation technique first, and then we will go a bit deeper and learn how to properly set up different player animations so we can swap between them by changing just one variable. Also, I'm giving away free premium sprite sheets today so that you can code along with me and get exactly the same result. Do you want to build polished, beautiful 2D games and learn JavaScript at the same time? Then join me and let me show you how to animate sprites properly with many tips and tricks along the way. This is complete, advanced vanilla JavaScript sprite animation, explained for beginners. Hope you get a lot of value out of this. Big like, please! In index.html, I create basic web page markup. I link my style CSS file. We will use it just to position canvas. I also link script.js that will contain all animation logic. Here I create HTML5 canvas element with an ID of canvas1. It will serve as our drawing board. In style CSS I give canvas some border, top 50%. This will only work if position is set to absolute. Left 50%. Transform translate minus 50% minus 50% will center our absolutely positioned canvas element in the middle of the page. Width will be 600 pixels and height 600 pixels as well. Now let's do a quick JavaScript setup. I will show you how little code you need to animate something on canvas. If at any point in this video you find yourself struggling, don't worry. It takes time and patience for all of us to learn these things. I structured this video to be very beginner friendly, but I do expect some basic knowledge of HTML, CSS and a little bit of JavaScript. If you are new to coding, or you feel you need to refresh your knowledge, maybe the best thing to do is to start with a good quality JavaScript course first, and then you can come back and work on all these creative projects with me. There aren't many purely vanilla JavaScript courses out there, and this is one of the best ones. It was made by Brad Traversy. Brad is a self-taught coder as well, and in this course he makes sure you go through all the important concepts to give you solid foundations you can build on. In programming, you can't learn everything from books. Sometimes you have to get your hands dirty. These courses are the best to explain concepts and then give you exercises to practice them on. I will leave a link in the video description to a list of teachers and courses on Udemy that really helped me on my self-taught journey. I still rewatch them or at least parts of them occasionally to refresh my memory. I create a custom variable called canvas that will hold a reference to my actual HTML canvas element I created in index.html. I point JavaScript towards it using get element by ID and I pass it ID I gave it, canvas1. Constant variable I call for example ctx, shortcut for context is equal to this canvas variable from line 1. Dot get context and I pass it 2D. I could also pass it webgl here which would give us access to a completely different set of drawing methods. But that's for another video. Now I have all canvas 2D drawing methods stored in my custom ctx variable and I can call them from here. For example ctx fill rect will call a method to draw a rectangle on canvas. If I console log ctx we can inspect this object. It has some properties which basically are global canvas settings such as fill style that says color of shapes we draw or font which sets size and font family of text we draw on canvas. This tutorial will be focused on sprite animation. We want to learn how to create animated characters for games. So we are most interested in built-in canvas draw image method, which sits right here. I will explain everything you need to know about draw image method and its three versions in a minute. It's easy, don't worry about it. <laughs> Before we do that, I will quickly finish canvas setup. To make sure we have correct scaling, I need to set canvas width and canvas height. By default, canvas will be set to 300 x 150 pixels and our drawings can come out distorted. That's why I will manually set it to 600 x 600, the same values I gave it in style CSS. I create a custom variable called canvas width. I will use capital letters here to make it clear. This is a global variable. 
I set it equal to canvas from line 1, dot, width, and I set it all to 600. Same width I gave it in style CSS. I do the same for canvas height, also 600. Now that we made sure scaling is correct, let's bring an image into the project. In this tutorial, I want to show you two different ways you can animate sprites. Very simple one for beginners, and then more advanced, more complex and flexible way, where you can just run commands like run, jump, sit, and it will play the correct animation for us. When you know both, you can decide which one to use when you are building your games. I want everyone to get the same result. That's why I will be giving away this animated sprite sheet for free today. It has 10 different animations. You can download it from the project files and code along with me if you want. This technique will work with any other sprite sheet, but especially if you are a beginner, it might be a good idea if you just follow exactly what I do first, and then when you fully understand the code, you can easily tweak it and make it work with your own sprite sheets. Click the like please and let me know in the comments if you're getting any value today. To bring image into JavaScript project, I can just declare a custom variable I call for example player image and I set it equal to new image like this. This is a built-in image class constructor. It will create HTML image element, same as you would create if you put image tag, img tag in index HTML markup. We can append it to our web page if you want, but today we will just use it to store that sprite sheet image for us so that we can animate it with the JavaScript. I need to give it source, so player image variable from line 6 dot src and I set it to path to my sprite sheet. Your path might be different, it depends on how you organized your project files. Let's animate something on canvas. I create a custom function called, for example, draw frame. Actually, let's call it animate because this is our animation loop. Let's make sure that's clear. Inside animation loop, first I want to clear old paint from canvas between every animation frame. So I take ctx variable from line 2 dot clear rectangle built in method. It expects four arguments to specify what area on canvas we want to clear. I want to clear the entire canvas, so from coordinates 0, 0 to canvas width, canvas height. Now we can draw. I will just test if everything works by drawing a simple rectangle at position 50, 50, and I give it width and height of 100 pixels. Now I can call a request animation frame built-in method, which will simply run a function we pass to it. It will call that function once. If I pass it animate, the name of its parent function from line 9, it will just run over and over, create an animation loop. So we declared animate. I also have to call it like this, and we have a black rectangle drawn on canvas. If we don't specify fill style, color of shapes on canvas always default to black. It looks like a static image, but it's actually animating the same rectangle over and over. I can simply prove it by creating a global variable called x, I set it to 0, and here on line 12 I replace hardcoded value with this variable, and every time animation loop runs I increase x by 1. I told you you don't need much code to animate something on canvas. Well done, you are a programmer now, see you later. <laughs> ok, there's a bit more I can show you. Let's put it back and let's use built-in draw image method to draw our sprite sheet on canvas. The goal of this video is to make sure we fully understand how to use vanilla JavaScript to navigate in any sprite sheet, and we will build this nice practice project together. We will have a drop down where we select different animations, and our dog will do whatever we tell them to do. My dog's name is Shadow, and he's well trained. Look. Shadow, sit. Shadow, roll. Jump. Good boy. <laughs> Draw image method is a bit special. You can pass it 3 or 5 or 9 arguments depending on how much control do you want to have over the image you are drawing. The first argument is always the image you want to draw, so I pass it player image variable from line 6. Then I pass it x and y coordinates, where on canvas I want my image to be drawn. If I pass it 0 for x and 0 for y, it will be drawn from the top left corner of canvas coordinates 0, 0. It will also keep the image at the original width and height. The sprite sheet I'm using has 10 rows and 11 columns of animation frames. It's many times larger than my canvas, so now we can only see this small part, 600 times 600 pixels, in the top left corner of my sprite sheet. 
it's 600 times 600 because that's the size I set my canvas to. So this is the version of draw image with only three arguments. It works and you can change X and Y coordinates to move your image around. But you would need to resize your images using some other programs such as Microsoft Paint or Photoshop. But you don't have to do that because draw image also accepts five arguments. That's its second version. If you pass it five arguments, the fourth argument will be width and fifth argument will be height. So we are now able to scale the image up and down and we can also stretch it vertically or horizontally. If I pass it canvas width and canvas height, it will stretch the image to match my canvas area, 600 times 600 pixels. And since the image is not the same ratio as my canvas, you can see the image is stretched just a little bit. Let's remove the black rectangle by commenting out line 11. I can pass any values as width and height and JavaScript will just stretch my image based on these values. You can also change X and Y to move the entire image around. The final third version of draw image method accepts nine arguments. This gives us the most control over the image. The first argument again is the image you want to draw. The next four arguments determine rectangular area we want to cut out from the source image. Source X, source Y, source width and source height. And the last four arguments will tell JavaScript where on our destination canvas we want to draw just that cropped out part onto destination X, destination Y, destination width and destination height. These last four values basically work the same as these four values in the previous draw image call I showed you. The only difference is they are not used to position and stretch the entire image, but just the area we cut out using these arguments. I comment out line 12, but I will leave it here for a reference. And on line 13, I will add source X, source Y, source width and source height arguments, and I will use them to cut out only one dock at a time. One frame from my large sprite sheet. So these four values determine area we cut out from the original sprite sheet. And these four values determine where on canvas we want to place that cut out piece of image onto. If I set source X to 0, source Y to 0, source width to 200, source height to 200, we are cutting out square 200 times 200 pixels from the top left corner. There is nothing in the area. If I change it to square 400 times 400 pixels, we can see part of our dog. I can put any values here and cut out any chunk of the original sprite sheet I want. I can also scale it, stretch it, I can do whatever I want here. I create a global variable called sprite width. Let's have a look at our sprite sheet. If I take width of the entire file and divide it by number of columns, I get width of one frame. My sprite sheet is 6876 pixels wide and it has 12 columns. 6876 divided by 12 is 573. I will use 575 for now because I made the last frame a bit smaller when assembling my sprite sheet in Photoshop and there's some margin that snuck in. Sometimes when you see that your animation is moving sideways when it shouldn't, try to fix it by adjusting width and height by small pixel amounts and watch what happens. I will show you a bit later what I mean, it's simple, you can just ignore it for now. <laughs> sprite height or height of a single frame will be height of my entire sprite sheet which is 5230 divided by the number of rows. We have 10 animations, 10 rows, so 5230 divided by 10 is 523. On line 15, I can replace source width and source height with sprite width and sprite height variables I just calculated. And now we are cropping out exactly one frame from our sprite sheet. And in destination width and destination height, instead of stretching it to cover the entire canvas, I can also use sprite width and sprite height variables here. And we are drawing the frame at its original size. 
If you are still not clear what each of these individual arguments passed to draw image method does, feel free to play with it. Change the values and see what happens. It's quite straightforward once you get used to it. Here I am giving it an image I want to draw. These four values specify a rectangular area to crop out from the original large sprite sheet. And here I am telling it where I want that cropped out piece of my sprite sheet to be displayed on canvas. If I set source x coordinate to 1 times sprite width, I am jumping one frame. As this number increases, I am moving to the right, jumping by the amount of sprite width. This way I can display my animation row frame by frame. When this number gets too high, there will be no frame there eventually. So source x argument allows us to cycle through sprite sheet horizontally. If I want to swap between different animations, the way our sprite sheet is structured, I have to travel through it vertically. We have source y argument for that. Again, starting from top would be 0 times sprite height variable from line 9, and that will give me the top row. In this case, we have idle animation there. 1 times sprite height is row 2, jump animation. Then there is fall animation, running, and so on. Traveling through this sprite sheet vertically along the y-axis switches between different animations and we do it by changing source y argument. Traveling horizontally cycles between individual frames of these animations and can be done by changing value we pass as source x argument. Instead of manually changing numbers like this, let's output it to variables. I create variables called frame x and frame y and I set them to 0 initially. Then I just replace hardcoded zeros inside my draw image method with frame x and frame y. And now I can swap between animation frames by assigning different values to these variables. Frame x cycles through frames of each animation horizontally. Frame y swaps between different animations. It travels through my sprite sheet vertically. How do you feel about draw image method so far? My goal today is to give you full understanding of draw image method and what each of its arguments does. When we get comfortable with it, we will be able to control sprite animations in any JavaScript game easily, and we can also use these animations for other web development projects, not just for games. If you watch this course, I know you are a creative person, and I know one day you will build amazing things. I hope you're getting some value today. This course is my attempt to get you excited about coding. Is it working? Now, let's cover a very simple way to animate your sprites first, and then I will show you a proper scalable advanced technique that is suitable for both small and large sprite animation projects. The simple way is this. We know that frame x variable cycles through our sprite sheet horizontally. First row in our sprite sheet is idle animation. It has seven frames. Inside animation loop on line 18, I can say if frame x from line 10 is less than seven, Increase frame x by 1, frame x plus plus. Else, meaning when it's equal or larger than 7, reset it back to 0. You can notice two things. Our animation is blinking and it's going very fast. Let's deal with it. First frame is 0, so last frame is actually position 6. If I change this to 6, the empty frame is removed and blinking is gone. On line 11, I can just change values of frame y, and we are animating different rows in the sprite sheet. Problem comes when I get to frame y4, which is row 5. We are starting from 0. This animation has 11 frames, but I'm cycling only until frame 6, so we are not playing the entire animation. When I get to this row, we have a problem again. Sitting animation has five frames and we are cycling through more frames here. So now it's blinking because we are including some empty frames. To get this to work properly, every time we want to swap between animations, we have to change frame Y value on line 11, but also this hardcoded number six on line 18. Ideally, it would have to be a variable that always changes to the correct value that reflects the number of frames for each animation row, depending which one we are animating right now. 
I would solve it by having a variable called, for example, max frame. I would slot it here. And every time I change frame y variable, I would change value of that max frame variable from 6 to whatever value we need here to display all frames. So 10 for this row and 4 for this row, since we are animating from frame 0. Animation is going very fast. To slow it down, we can use this simple trick. I will create a LED variable called game frame and I set it to 0. On line 22, inside animation loop, I take this game frame variable and for every loop, we increase it by 1. So now, game frame is endlessly increasing as our animation loop runs over and over. On line 19, I create an if statement. Let me just write it and I will explain it when we see the whole thing. I say if game frame modulus percentage symbol something question marks for now is equal to zero, only then increase frame x. On line 13, I create a custom constant variable called stagger frames. Whatever value I give it, it will slow down animation by that amount. Let's try 5. On line 20, I say if game frame modulus stagger frame is 0, only then increase frame x. Modulus operator percentage symbol is also called remainder operator. It returns remainder when we divide the first number by the second. Let's say game frame is 17 and stagger frames is 5. 17 modulus 5 is 2. Because 17 divided by 5 is 3, that gives us 15 and remainder to 17 is 2. Remainder operator simply divides the first operand by the second one and returns the remainder. Here I am checking if the remainder is 0. Game frame is ever increasing in number and stagger frames is always 5. This statement will return remainder 0 and be true every 5 frames. So because I set stagger frames to 5, this code block on line 20 will run every 5 frames, slowing down our animation 5 times. New frame in our sprite sheet will only be served every time the main animation loop runs 5 times. I can also slow it just by 2. 0 here will stop animating. The higher the number you use, here as stagger frames, the slower the animation will be. Let's leave it at 5 for now. I think it looks good for most animations. As I said, when I change frame Y to 4, if I want to display all frames in my animation, I also have to change 6 here, on line 21 to number 9. For shorter animation rows, like this sitting animation, it has only 5 frames, so I have to change this number to 4. So now we have a way to swap between animations, but we always have to change two values. Once we are comfortable with sprite animation, we will use it in our game. Our character will be able to jump. When it reaches the peak height and starts falling back down, we will switch to fall animation. We can also sit, which will stop the game from scrolling. We can also roll, which will speed up the game, and we can attack enemies this way. I can also add this dizzy animation, for example, when we hit an obstacle. You can see all available animations if you check out the sprite sheet. Let's refactor this code and let me show you more advanced sprite animation method that allows us swap in between different animation states by changing just one value. We are venturing into a bit more advanced territory. If you are new to JavaScript, don't worry if it takes you a bit longer to understand what I'm about to show you. It becomes easier with practice. We all started somewhere. I delete code between lines 20 and 23. We used it to cycle between animation frames horizontally. In this more advanced method, we will do it differently. I set frame Y to zero. That's my top row, idle animation. I also delete lines 17 and 18. They are commented out anyway. Let's clean this up. Inside animation loop on line 17, I create a let variable called, for example, position. Its job will be to cycle through horizontal sprite sheets, but in a different way. We will need this later. 
I take a game frame variable from line 12. This variable is increasing over and over on line 20 as animation loop runs. I divide it by stagger frames variable from line 13. And I wrap all of this in math.floor to get rid of potential decimal points. I want this value to be only integers, whole numbers without decimal points. Then I take this entire value and I do remainder operator and 6. 6 is here because I'm doing idle animation which has 6 frames, counting from 0. This line of code is not the easiest thing to wrap your head around. I said this would be slightly more advanced. Don't worry if you're struggling to read this, this is not beginner level JavaScript anymore. What's happening here on line 17, game frame divided by stagger frames means we will have to increase game frame 5 times before we get to 1. Because as game frame variable increases, 1 divided by 5 is 0 0.2, 2 divided by 5 is 0 0.4, 3 divided by 5 is 0 0.6, game frame 4 divided by stagger frames 5 is 0 0.8, and only when we get to game frame 5 divided by stagger frame 5 we get value of 1 here. So as game frame cycled from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, by dividing game frame by stagger frames we got 0, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6 and 0.8. All of these values were turned into zeros because it's wrapped in math.floor. It took 5 animation loops, 5 increases of game frame variable to get to number 1 here. When this is 1, 1 modulus 6 is 1 because 1 divided by 6 is 0 and remainder from 0 to 1 is 1. Basically this value increases by 1 every time game frame variable increases by 5, slowing or staggering our animation 5 times, making it 5 times slower. We are using math.floor, removing decimal points from these divisions. For the first 5 frames we get 0 modulus 6 which is 0, then this calculation increases to 1. For the next 5 frames 1 modulus 6 is 1, then 2 modulus 6 is 2, 3 modulus 6 is 3, and so on. Position variable increases until it reaches 6. 6 modulus 6 is 0, 7 modulus 6 is 1, 8 modulus 6 is remainder 2, and so on. This calculation makes sure position variable only cycles between 0 and this number. I appreciate that this calculation is quite complex. This is not course in advanced mathematics and logic. So for now, just take this little formula here and believe me when I say it works. Don't worry about understanding it completely, we are focusing on JavaScript today. Being able to understand this calculation has nothing to do with your ability to be good with JavaScript. These are two unrelated skills. On line 18, I take frame x variable from line 10 and I set it equal to sprite width from line 8. And I multiply it by this position variable we just calculated on line 17. As I said, this position variable will cycle between 0 and number we put here. First row in my sprite sheet has 7 frames, starting from 0. Frame x will be cycling through these values horizontally. On line 19, inside the draw image, I remove sprite width because width of our sprites is already accounted for inside my frame x variable on line 18. I misspelled stagger frames on line 17. When I fix this small typo, we can see this is working and we are animating row 1 in our sprite sheet. Don't feel that you need to fully understand this calculation on line 17 to be good at JavaScript. I did not come up with this formula. Tricks like this are usually figured out by someone much smarter than me. We can just use them and they will work for us. I could have achieved the same result using a bit more code and simple, more readable calculations. This is more complex and hard to read for beginners because it's such a short calculation. It's kind of a neat trick to use this, but it's not a necessity. I like it because it makes the code look clean and compact. I can still change value of stagger frames variable on line 15 and it will slow down or speed up my animation. This is really nice code base to animate any sprite sheet, but it can be done even better. To swap between animations, I still have to change frame y variable on line 11 
and I have to make sure that this value on line 17 sets the correct amount of frames per row to make sure we don't have any empty frames or that we are animating all available frames from that particular row, depending on what animation we are currently drawing. The sprite sheet we are using today is regular and symmetrical. All the sprites have the same width and the same height. The technique I will show you now can be used for this type of sprite sheet, but also for sprite sheets that are more irregular and have frames of different sizes. I would like to have a code structure like this. Some kind of data array called, for example, sprite animations, that contains objects. Each object's name in this array is the same as the name of that particular animation it holds data for, so for example idle, jump, run, and so on. Each of these objects can contain additional data, for example for irregular sprites it can be pixel values for width and height, that can be different for each frame, and mainly it will contain locations array. This location array will hold a set of JavaScript objects, and each of these objects will have x and y property. Each of these objects represents one frame in that particular animation, and its x and y properties will be coordinates we need if we want to use draw method to cut out this particular frame from the sprite sheet. That way we can access any frame we want anytime by directly targeting positions in this array. I can just cycle through this location array with a for loop and it will always play the entire animation for me without the need to set up number of frames each animation has each time. It will know how many frames that animation has based on the number of objects in this location array. Each object will be one frame. So how do we create a data structure like this with JavaScript and how do we map it correctly to match our sprite sheet? Let me show you. On line 14, I create a custom constant variable I call, for example, sprite animations, and I set it equal to an empty array. This will serve as the main container to hold all data for all my animations. I will create another variable I call animation states. This will also be an array, and I will use it as a place where I can create kind of a simple map that will match my doc sprite sheet. I will go through my sprite sheet row by row from top to bottom. For every animation row in my sprite sheet, I will create an object like this, with two properties. Name property will be whatever I want to call that animation row. So for the first row, let's call it idle. And I will also need frames property. I check my sprite sheet and I see that idle animation is made out of seven frames. The second row I will call jump animation and it has seven frames. I will create an object like this for every row in my sprite sheet, going from top to bottom. But before I do that, let's check if it works. On line 15, I have this animation states array, which currently contains two objects, one for idle and one for jump animation. I could have also given it more properties, but this sprite sheet is not irregular. So name and frames properties is all I need to map coordinates for each animation frame. I take animation states array and I call build in array for each method. For each method executes provided function once for each array element. I will do ES6 syntax here. This is so-called arrow function. It's a simplified syntax to write function expression in JavaScript. I can skip function keyword here and I just create brackets where arguments I pass to this callback function go. With for each, the first argument we pass to it is just a variable that will represent each element in the array as we are cycling through it. I will call it state. As for each method runs, state will first represent this object, then this object, and so on if we add more. I'm simply saying inside this callback function I'm about to write refer to these objects as state. So this name property can be accessed as state.name, for example. I will also pass it second argument I call index. Index is another built-in feature of for each array method. It simply stores number of each element as we cycle through the array. So this first object will have index 0, this will have index 1, and so on. I expect you understand basic array manipulation with JavaScript and fundamental methods like for each, but I still wanted to explain in case we have some beginners here. So this callback function will run for each element in my animation states array. Now, I want to run through animation states and create data structure like this. 
that maps my sprite sheet and coordinates for each frame. I create LED variable called frames and I set it equal to an object. Inside I will have property called LOC location. That will be an empty array for now. I will create a for loop that will cycle through state.frames property. So for idle animation it will run 7 times as I set it here on line 18. Every time this for loop runs I want to calculate x and y coordinates of that animation frame from my sprite sheet and I want to place them inside location array on line 27. How do I calculate that? I create a temporary variable called position x and it will be equal to j variable from the for loop times sprite width that I set to 575 pixels earlier. As a for loop runs and j increases, position x will be calculated for each frame. I will also need position y which will be index from line 25 times sprite height. We declared sprite height earlier and we set it equal to 523 pixels to match our sprite sheet. Position y will be the same for all 7 frames of idle animation. When for each method moves to the second animation object here, index will increase and for that animation row different position y will be calculated. This might be quite a lot going on if you are a beginner. This is more advanced than the first sprite animation method. Don't feel discouraged if you are struggling to follow. It takes time and practice. It wasn't easy for any of us at first. <laughs> so this for loop calculates position x and position y for each frame as it cycles through my sprite sheet. Every time we calculate x and y, I take frames.location array from line 27 and I use push method. I create another small object here on a fly. It has x property set to position x from line 30 and y property set to position y from line 31. I push these values into my location array on line 27. So this for loop will run through all the frames in one row, in this case 7 times and once we create 7 objects with x and y coordinates and push them into location array. I take sprite animations array from line 14 and I create a new key in there. I will create something called key value pair. Key is the name of the property, value is the value of that property. <laughs> so I'm taking sprite animations array from line 14 and I'm passing it state.name, which will first refer to idle, then to jump, as for each method runs through animation states array. I'm saying create a new key new property in sprite animations array, call it idle and its value will be frames from line 27. Frames object contains locations array, which I just filled with 7 objects that contain x and y properties for each frame in this animation. That's it, we created a data structure that maps locations in my sprite sheet. I can console log it now. I can see I made a typo here on line 29. You probably noticed it already. <laughs> this should be J, not S. <laughs> so now I'm console logging animation states from line 15. That's fine. But what I actually want to see is sprite animations array from line 14, which we just created and filled with data. You can see that my sprite animations contains two properties called idle and jump. If I look inside, each contains location array from line 27 and number of elements in that array corresponds to frames I declared for each animation. Each of these values was calculated here on lines 30 and 31. You can see that all y coordinates for idle are 0 and for jump animation vertical y coordinate is 523 as we moved on to the second row in our sprite sheet. Now I can replace hardcoded number 6 here on line 40 with length of these locations arrays. I access this location array by targeting sprite animations.lock. Actually no, I skipped one level. I need to specify if I want location array for idle or jump. Let's just hard code idle here for a moment and I want length of this array. Remember I am just replacing hard coded number 6 that was here. So dot length and that's it. Now it's dynamic. I can add animations with 4 or 15 frames per row or however many I want and it will still work with no blank or left out animation frames. Here I am accessing sprite animations from line 14, idle, location.length. 
Inside animation loop, we are still calculating frames using frame X and frame Y variables from lines 10 and 11. We don't need these anymore because now we have the exact coordinates stored in locations array. I delete lines 10 and 11. On line 40, I add let keyword in front of frame X and I will declare frame Y variable here. Frame Y is just a value we can see here, so I can access it by saying sprite animations idle. Dot location at index position from line 39 dot Y. I could do the same thing for frame X or I can just leave it as is, both will work. Let's replace idle with a jump. It breaks. Hmm. Notice that row 1 with idle animation was working and row 2 doesn't, which suggests something is wrong with how we draw vertical position. Inside draw image on line 43, I remove sprite width value from source y argument. We don't need it anymore as frame y contains complete already calculated coordinate. Now I can go back inside animation states array and I add data for all the remaining animations. It's important to understand that you can't skip rows here. You have to go row by row from top to bottom to match your sprite sheet because vertical y coordinate is tied to index in for each method. I add full animation with 9 frames, run animation has 9 frames, dizzy 11 frames, sit has only 5 frames, roll 7 frames, and so on. I also need to make sure there is comma between every object. If I try fall, I get blink in. There must be an empty frame. Fall animation is actually only 7 frames. If I put less here, we play only part of animation. If I put more here, we get blink in because some frames are empty. Run animation works. Dizzy works. Sit animation works as well. You can see sit animation has 5 frames and dizzy animation has 11 frames and I can swap between them easily without having to manually change number of frames like we did before. Roll animation works. Byte animation works. Let's go back to idle. Putting hardcoded text here like this is not ideal of course. I go up to line 10 and I create a variable called player state. I set it to run initially. Down on line 71 and 73, I replace idle with this new player state variable. Now I can swap between animations here on line 10. Sit works, jump works, fall works. In index.html, I create a new div with a class of controls. Inside, there will be a select element with an ID of animations and name animations. Label for animations will say choose animation. I give it some options that match names we gave to animations in script.js file. In style CSS, I target controls and I give it position absolute, Z index 10, top 50 pixels, and transform translate X minus 50% to center it horizontally. I take controls, select, and option, and I increase their font size to 25 pixels. I can also remove the border around my canvas. I want animations to change when I choose different value in this dropdown. In script.js, I take player state from line 10 and I put it up top on line 1. I create a constant variable called dropdown and I point it towards this new select element with ID of animations. I 
I take drop down and call add event listener on it. I will listen for change event. Every time its value changes, we will take player state from line 1, and since we are inside callback function on event listener, we have access to event object. I'm referring to it as E. Event object has target property. Target is simply referring to an element that was clicked. And it has value property because I have added values myself. Whenever any of these option elements in my dropdown is clicked, player state variable will be set to its value attribute. Now I can easily swap between different animations in my sprite sheet just by selecting different option in a dropdown. That was a lot we covered today, wasn't it? If you are a beginner and you are still with me, well done. If you want, you can practice these techniques on a different sprite sheet to really solidify all the concepts we covered today. We are not done with this yet. In the next part, I will show you how to use this technique in an actual game. You can also check out my other vanilla JavaScript playlists if you're still feeling creative. I'll see you there.